And that's why we named everything Charbet because Karakashevich Distillery just doesn't fit on the label. No, just one, just one too many characters, huh? Oh my God, yeah. You know, filling in the bubbles in school was always fun. Remember that shit? You know, yeah. <laughs> This is episode 193 of Bourbon Pursuit. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny, and let's run through just a little bit of the news. The fourth annual American Whiskey Convention is going to be taking place on April 5th in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Over 250 American whiskeys will be available for you to try, and you can network with other industry peers and fans just like you. Find out more at AmericanWhiskeyConvention.com. Thank you to everybody that joined Ryan and I at this past week's Louisville Bourbon Society meeting. It was great to meet a lot of you and share some of those Pursuit Series bottles with you as well. It was also kind of a reality check for us because we didn't realize about 10% of the room had no idea what a podcast was. So that's a call to action for all you young whippersnappers out there. If you've got relatives getting into whiskey, instead of telling them, let's show them how to subscribe. Another great article came out this week from America's favorite whiskey personality, Wade Woodard. He uses some scientific methods and blind tastings to see if he could create a better version of barrel-finished bourbons using a mixture of ingredients in his own liquor cabinet. He takes on the likes of Angel's Envy Port Finish, Bell Mead Cognac Finish, and this year's Parker's Heritage Curacao Finish. And he does it with his own blends. You can read all the results at tater-talk.com. Now, today's episode features Char Bay. This is one that I kind of stumbled across because it has an interesting story at the end of the day. And I was first introduced to their whiskey like many people get their first steps. And that's at a tasting event. I remember getting this crazy, funky taste and I couldn't believe what it was. Hops and whiskey? Like, no way. But... It was totally way, like very way. So you're going to love it. We have a new Patreon reward levels available, and they're starting at just $1 per month. Go check it out at patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit, because really it's this community that funds this podcast and keeps it going. So thank you to everybody out there that is a Patreon supporter today. And I challenge you at least to go and check out Patreon and help support this as much as you can. As usual, we got Fred Minnick to round us out with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. As you listen to this, I am likely sitting in a room with more than 40 tasters from all over the world. Some are high-end distributors, others are elite bartenders, and there are a few journalists in the room. But all come from several different types of spirits backgrounds. We are the judges of the San Francisco World Spirits Competition. For me, I've been a judge for almost 10 years, and it's one of my greatest honors. It's my Super Bowl of the spirits world. I get to taste with the very best in the world, the most elite palates, people who can analyze a tequila and tell you where it came from. And the same with scotch and, dare I say, vodkas. Yes, there are actual vodka experts, and I actually do respect them. I'm kind of the bourbon guy, as you can imagine. And every year, I get most of the bourbons truckloaded through my panels, and we taste them, and we decide the fate of what wins or what gets a gold or gets a double gold. And we do all of this blind, so we don't know what we're tasting. So when you see a a gold medal or a double gold or a best bourbon, you can have a guarantee that there was no bias, no perceived bias that we had when we were tasting it. In years past, Knob Creek has won, Four Roses has won, some of the Buffalo Trace Antique Collections has won. Last year, Henry McKenna, Bottle and Bond won. And you really never know, because a tasting is how people are tasting that day. Someone may have had a, a cold a week ago that influenced how they're tasting today, And someone may have, you know, had a cheeseburger that required a little bit more, you know, depth on the palate. So you just never know how these tastings will go. It's almost like the NCAA tournament. 
It's very rare that a 16 seed will beat a one seed, but it happened last year. You might see a 12 seed beat a five seed. That's a pretty regular upset, but it's very similar. We're all human and we're all impacted by our environment and the people around us. So whatever happens in this competition on the day that we bestow the world's best bourbon, just know that if it happened a week later, we could have different results. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you have an idea for Above the Char, hit me up on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Search my name, Fred Minnick. Until next week, cheers. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky, and you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single-barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly and be 21. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, Nose Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to NoseYourBourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or TheBourbonConcierge.com, and you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits, and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, The Memory Game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout. And if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. Welcome back to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kitty here today doing another cool remote interview with a distillery that I had the first opportunity of being able to try this. I remember it was at Bourbon Bonanza uh, probably two years ago trying it. And then there was a second time trying it again at one of my buddy's places that were out in San Diego. And it was so unique uh, in the taste profile as well as the finish and being able to sort of take a breath afterwards and being like, did I just taste what I think I tasted? And it was, it was something that I, I kind of had this idea and I said, well, let me do a little bit of research, figure out more about what this company is all about. And just going through doing a little bit of Googling and learning about our guest today, it's a pretty interesting story. And I thought it was one that's going to be worthy of getting out there to the masses, because I think once you have an opportunity to kind of know their story, uh, hopefully then you'll be able to Go and track down a bottle, try it, get a few friends together, buy a bottle and split it, whatever it is. And I think you're going to be 
pretty impressed to just kind of understand the story behind it and understand uh, the process that's so unique that goes into making this particular whiskey as well. So with that, I will go ahead and introduce our guest today. So today on the show, we have Marco Karakashevic. And I know I'm probably going to screw it up again by saying it, but Marco is the master distiller and owner of Charbay Whiskey out of California. So Marco, welcome to the show. Yeah, man. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate it. It's cool. Yeah. So, so it's, it's your native name. Say your name so I don't butcher it again so everybody knows. Yeah, it. It's Marco Karakashevic. Karakashevic. Now it's easier after we start drinking, man. It all works. Out. <laughs> so what's the what's the lineage of the name? Where where does what's it come the from? Deal? Uh, my family's been distilling now for thirteen generations. Uh, my dad's side of the family is uh, from Serbia, uh, from the Vojvodina Valley. So that's uh, a big valley towards Hungary. And since 1751, uh, my family's been recognized as a distilling family, and we had uh, we had a pretty good business uh, over there until uh, everything got nationalized in the 60s. And then my dad said, "You know, hey, what am I going to do?" Um, so he's out. So he was the first out of 12 generations ever to leave. Made his way to the United States. Made his way to California. Made his way to Napa Valley. And that's where I grew up. And uh, then he had a winemaking job up in Mendocino County, like about an hour north of Napa. And then uh, in 1983, uh, my mom and dad said, that's it. Um, We're going to start our uh, winery and distillery here in Mendocino County. And at the time, there was, uh, you know, St. George started a year before in 82, um, Steve up in Clear Creek, up in uh, 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 Oregon. Uh, I think he started in 82 or 83, 84, but we started in 83. And at the time, there was, there was the three of us. Uh, now there's how many uh, micro distilleries popped up so far? About uh, 2,000 now? Yeah, I would say. Yeah, there's there's quite something a bit. this year, a something like that, yeah. And we started, uh, we started making wines and brandies traditionally, you know, uh, that's what my family was distilling and growing up in a distilling family. So I was 10 in 83 and my first job in the, in the distillery was, uh, in the still and, uh, sitting on a bucket, cleaning with a green scrubber, you know, overhead inside the still dripping TSP and stuff back in the day when you could do that stuff. And, you <laughs> it's know, it's like, safe. We promise. promise. Just get in. Yeah. There. Uh, oh man, I'm done. You're not done. I'm like, Oh man. Okay. Well, whatever. So I just keep going. And, uh, yeah. So we, we bought a brand new Prulo Charente Cognac still because that's the best still in the world to make brandy. And so we had that shipped over and installed, and it's right over here. I'm using it still today. Not today, but next week. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's nice and quiet in here today. Um, so I grew up learning how to make brandy, uh, traditionally seven fraction double distillation, uh, cognac style, cognac brandy distillation. And little by little, you know, I always had a fascination with American whiskey because we never made it. You know, we made grappa, uh, we made brandy and eau de vis. And so being a kid, you know, in a distilling family, you know, that's, that's your life. And uh, by high school, I was uh, brewing beer. And little by little, you know, I just uh, was like, I just, I just made this Pilsner. And it was really flavorful. It was two-row malted barley. And then I'm learning from other distilleries in the United States that uh, whiskey is distilled from two-row malted barley. Like, well, what do they do? What are they doing differently that I'm not doing or doing? And uh, they're getting two-row malted barley. They're fermenting it into a distiller's beer. And they're running that 5 6 7% alcohol distiller's beer through the still collecting the alcohol, putting it in the barrel. I just had this batch of beer. It's delicious. It's got hops in it, of course, you know. I'm like, what? 
well, why can't I just run this through the still? You know, it's tasty. I mean, he, my dad's always stressed on me that, you know, you've got to use the best quality. You know, you, if you use inferior quality, you're you're distilling inferior quality and you can't do that to survive. You got to make the best product possible by using the best sources possible. So I said, well, I asked him, like, well, if if this is super delicious beer, then why can't I run it through the still and make super delicious whiskey? You can't do that. Nobody's doing that. It's got hops in it. You just don't do that. I'm like, oh, okay. All right. You know, so that was in the 80s, you know, and uh, jumped to the 90s. My dad and I had the opportunity to take 22,000 gallons of a Czech style Pilsner lager, truly lagered, bottom fermenter, lagered at 38 degrees for three weeks. And just a delicious beer from a microbrewery in Northern California. And uh, we took a tanker a week, which is 6,500 gallons per week. And uh, we double distilled it. We were, we were working like three and a half weeks straight, 24 hours a day. And uh, we ended up making 22 barrels of this. Well, tell everybody for the audio listeners what, what this is. Oh, this is Charbet Pilsner whiskey. There you go. It's a trophy. <laughs> so, wish I, had, so I wish definitely I had so much more of this. <laughs> so I definitely want to talk more about that because, uh, but I, I kind of want to rewind a little bit too because you know yeah. you had mentioned that your thirteenth generation distiller. Uh, it almost kind of reminds me of like friends whose dads that are doctors and they're like, you've got to grow up and be a doctor. You got to be a lawyer. You got to get in the family business. Did you yeah. ever have an out or did you kind of say they're like, well, I'm, if I'm already 10 and cleaning the stills, I don't think I'm going to be getting out of this anytime soon. Uh, Kenneth, I was getting fed and uh, you know, I was living in the house. So, um, and uh, so I had no choice and, but, you know, come around high school, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to be a physical therapist too, because I love helping people and I love traveling. So I wanted to be an international physical therapist. I thought that sounded pretty cool. You know, like work here for six months, blast out, go somewhere else, you know, wow, that sounds really neat. So I went to college, uh, UC Davis for a year and, uh, my dad said, you know, when he called me one day, he's like, what are you going to do? You're going to go off, do your own thing or come back and work with us. I'm like, well, dad, you know, I, I want to run the still, but uh, you know, I need to get paid, you know? And he's like, we'll figure that out. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, let me finish up this, uh, let me finish up this term and I'm out of here. I'll come back. Came back, went to work, you know, 10 years later, started getting paid, <laughs> you know, but I lived on the property on Spring Mountain and uh, I was working with my dad side by side for, uh, you know, my whole life, it seems like. Almost like and, an indentured servant for a little bit. Well, you know, it was a true uh, apprenticeship with a master and uh, it's, it's pretty cool because the definition of master distiller in my family, I know it's different for everybody. Uh, but in my family, the definition is the ability to meet and exceed your instructor. And then my dad said also, make a product that the family hasn't made before in the history of our family and start selling it. Mm -hmm. And you've kind of hit that mark a little bit. Well, so I said, okay. Um, we make O to V. We make fabulous clear distillates that show off the still, that show off the cuts, that show off the distiller, that show off the quality of the base ingredient and the aging process and everything without barrel influence. The distillate's got to be pro. You know, if you're selling a clear spirit, in my mind, it's got to be fantastic right off the pipe. Mm-hmm. So I said, you know, hey, you know, I've been making eau de vies with my dad, like rum as well, and brandy eau de vie, and uh, I'm gonna make a, I'm gonna make a clear whiskey, but it's gonna be in the form of an eau de vie. It's gonna have fantastic body. It's gonna have a ton of flavor. The finish is gonna last forever, and it's gonna be crystal clear. I'm gonna age it in stainless, and it's gonna be badass. 
So you've got to explain to me first, like what's an O to V for all of us lame people out there that are just, just not, not into the, the jargon that you know. Yeah. Uh, o to V uh, is a French term for a uh, water of life or clear distill. It's something that gets distilled uh, usually a brandy uh, from fruit, uh, uh, raspberries. There's one very popular, Fonbois, is uh, fantastic. Uh, we also distilled Black Mission Fig and made a fig eau de vie, which is so good. Pain in the ass to make, but fabulous. Uh, so a clear dist- uh, I, I call a clear distill, it's eau de vie, gotcha. especially with the still that I use. So I had the opportunity to... Uh, to grab a, 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 an IPA and I bought it myself. I brought it in, double copper alambic pot distilled it, aged it in stainless for four years as a clear distillate, as a light whiskey. That was the category that, that I went into so that I didn't have to put it in a barrel. Um, and, uh, well, he had put it in for a day. So I put it in for a day took it out because I didn't want any oak influence. And so I aged it for four years. Um, Doubled and twisted is the brand that I came up with. Doubled and twisted is an old liquor term for you're drinking the good stuff because in my mind, in a lot of people's minds, double distilled is better for a couple reasons. You develop body on the first run. On the second run, you concentrate the flavor of the whiskey on the second run. So if something's double distilled, it's fabulous or you potentially. And at about 160 proof, the distillate really twists, makes like a really nice tight helix spiral coming off the pipe. So back in the day when people didn't have hydrometers and they're running still and they're looking and they double distill. And then on the second run, right around 160 proof right there, it's just got a beautiful twist to it. And they're like, that's the doubled and twisted. That's the good stuff right there. It's a good so, story behind it. Yeah. Yeah, it's real. And then, you know, so I'm running still. It's like, you know, four in the morning, you know, and this was starting to come out on, on a run. And I take my – I get over the, where the port is, where the, where the distal comes off the still. And I'm like, son of a bitch, it's really doing it. So I like, click, took a picture, made that my label. Got some jugs that I got, you know, from a from a glass supplier. Uh, got all the cola label approvals, formula approvals, all that stuff, and got it all done. And then uh, we started selling it in '09. And I told my dad, I'm like, hey, uh, you know, I'm selling the DNT. And he's like, congratulations, you're a goddamn master distiller. <laughs> the way you said that is just kind of like, welcome to the club. <laughs> yep. He's like, let's drink some, smoke cigars. I'm like, hell yeah, okay. So that was in uh, 2009. It took me 26 years of being an apprentice from my dad, uh, but uh, I learned everything uh, from my dad, and then uh, I expanded on it. Mm -hmm. And that's cool. That's heritage, you know? Uh, it's, uh, It's taking what your family tradition is and expanding on it and keeping it real and keeping it alive and uh, i hope to do that with uh, my two sons as well i've got a seven-year-old and a almost two-year-old right now so the 14th generation already knows where the distillate comes out of the pipe um, they love the bottling line they got a full-on distillery they got customers i'm like man you guys better get into this because I need to go to Mexico. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but you're not ready to retire already, then, are you? Oh no, uh, you know. But uh, I do like to take a break every once in a while. Yeah, you know, absolutely. You need a vacation, right? Ooh, yeah. I mean, yeah, it would be nice. <laughs> so another question I kind of wanted to go back to was. You know, you said that you got an IPA and you were the first person to kind of sit there and start distilling hops. Now, you you don't hear this very often. And the one thing that kind of comes to mind, especially for a lot of whiskey and bourbon drinkers out there, is like, aren't you going to like clog the still up by trying to do this? Because it isn't like like a super chunky thing that you're trying to you're trying to do here. Well, I'm taking beer, you know, mm-hmm. beer that you can drink. 
And uh, TTB didn't really know what to do with us back in 1999. Um, they asked, you know, they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm distilling beer just like every other whiskey distillery on the planet. So you've got it going through the, the fermentation process already, right? So it's already gone through the masher, I guess, and the cooker. And the cooker is essentially, or actually, never mind. You've just got the beer, right? You don't necessarily, or you're not cooking anything. No, I've got the beer. Um, I, I use... Uh, my friends microbreweries to do the beer Mm -hmm. and then i've got pros making pro beer for me and i just put it in a tanker truck and i bring it over Mm -hmm. and so it's ready to roll yeah so what's like because i mean we think about it from a typical um you know bourbon persona we have this idea of that it has to be 51 percent corn it has to be this kind of grain breakdown I mean, are there other grains that are going into this? Like, what's what's your all's particular? Without in this, their trade secrets you only give away. But like, is there a breakdown of of types of grains that you use to go into this particular beer? It's two row malted barley. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, it's a recipe um, from the brewery. <clears throat> so, for example, uh, I make a, I make a whiskey distilled from Big Bear Black Stout. And it's a specific recipe. It's got six different roasted and toasted barley malts, two different adjuncts, two different hops in it. So it's a delicious, complex beer. And uh, as a result, you know, when you distill delicious, you concentrate delicious. I mean, because that was honestly going to be my next question is that you did a Pilsner. I was like, what other beers have you tried? Yeah. Um, Well, you know, the Pilsner was working really well. So I, that's when I decided, uh, that, well, plus, um, when we made the, when we made the Pilsner the first time, uh, that microbrewery decided to focus on wine instead of focusing on wine and beer. So they, they shut their brewery down. So I was like, oh man, what am I going to do? I got to go to a different distill, um, a different, uh, brewery to find beer. Um, at that time as well. We started making fresh picked fruit flavored vodkas, like real flavored vodka out of ruby red grapefruit and blood oranges and Meyer lemons. And that blew up because there was no ultra premium vodka in the market. Excuse me. Kettle One was the ultra premium back then and still a fabulous vodka. But no one was making really fantastic fresh picked fruit flavored vodkas back then. So we started doing that and it, it blew up. And at the time, it was only mom, dad, and me, no employees, you know? So I was making everything, selling everything, flying all over the place. So it, was, it was wild. And then around 2005, I started feeling more pressure on the vodka side. And I said, you know, man, I got to get back. I got to start running the still, start making some more whiskeys. And so I needed to find another uh, microbrewery to uh, fulfill my, my orders. And so I said, well, I love Racer 5 IPA. And uh, Barrier Public Brewery is like 20 minutes away. So I went down there and uh, we had like a four hour little visit. And now I just text them and get tankers. <laughs> there you go. That's easy <laughs> enough. That's cool, dude. That is so cool. They're like, whatever you want to do. You want to come back and you want to tweak the recipe? You want to do this? You want to do this? I'm like, oh my God. This is, I mean, they're, such, they're the nicest people to work with, the Norgroves from Barrier Public Brewery. Uh, and uh, everyone, uh, their staff, is just a real treat and pleasure to be able to work with them like this. Mm-hmm. So cool. Yeah, and so, all you, I mean, you, you kind of skip, you're kind of like outsourcing some of the steps there a little bit, right? I can't do everything, man. You know, it's just like even today, after 35 years, there's we're a team of seven people. You know, mm-hmm. I have no loans. I have no investors. Mm-hmm. Uh, I make product. I sell product. I buy more glass. I buy more ingredients and uh, I'm making a living. My family's making a living and my employees are making a living. And, you know, here we are. Absolutely. So the other thing, the other thing that kind of uh, was a little different was when you said that you aged it in stainless kind of talk about that, because if we, if we think about it a little bit from a, a bourbon side of the house, you know, one of the, the most famous stainless uh, aged products or stainless products that have been out there for the longest time was Sazerac 18 from Buffalo Trace, where they had started putting in the tank back in 2000. I don't, shit, I can't remember. It's 2004, 2008, and then uh, maybe 2005. I can't remember. But then I think it was 2015 or 2016 is when they actually ran out of the, the stainless. And the idea was that it 
consistently holds this flavor over time. However, there are other people out there that says, oh, no, it changes a little bit in the tank. So kind of give your thoughts on aging in a stainless steel tank. For a, a barrel aged product to then be aged in stainless before it gets bottled. Well, or? that was that was uh, an example that maybe a lot of bourbon people can relate to. But your your particular or my uh, doubled and twisted thesis. Yeah, your your double your your process that it goes through for your your aging. Yeah, for that. Well, for the double and twisted for my liquid thesis, so to speak, I wanted to not have uh, any barrel age influence whatsoever i wanted to showcase the distillate and when you have something and you let it rest for years in stainless you know all the flavors that you've just distilled out they're all shattered they're all scattered they need time for themselves to line up in their unique pattern to make a longer longer chain of flavor and if you have the luxury of time to age a distillate before you put it in the bottle and send it out, it's just it just makes a better quality product. Because you know, if you if you distill something a week before you distilled that beer, it was uh, beer, and a couple of weeks before that, it was uh, water, some yeast, and uh, you know, a ton of grain. It's going through some massive physical changes, you know, from from being grain to being boiled with water to being fermented once and then sublimated and boiled out, you know. <clears throat> and it's just really important to give it time. What uh, what I did with what we did with the the Pilsner whiskey is we uh, we distilled it in '99 and we put it in brand new oak barrels for uh, six years. And in those six years, it really extracted all the colors and flavors of the barrels. And now you have that oak influence. Now you have this flavorful whiskey. Let's let it ride. Let's put it together. So then we took it out of the barrel because I didn't want to over-oak it. There's plenty of over-oaked products in the world. And so I took it out of the barrel and we put it in a stainless tank after barrel aging for eight more years. And wow, that's what, pretty. That's a lot of time. Yeah, and after that, I mean, I mean, what that eight years did is it allowed the whiskey to interact with all the oak influence, and everything started to line up in its own unique pattern, and it developed a longer and longer and longer chain of flavor. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the double the aging. And so that was that was in your your Char Bay whiskey Pilsner releases, correct? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How many of those have you had? Five releases of that stuff. And the you know, go ahead. We're we're out of it now. I mean, we, our last barrel was barrel number sixteen. I was holding it for Joe Montana because uh, in the in the beginning he was buying like single bottles of our whiskey one release and stuff. And my friend's like, "Hey, you just missed Joe. He's at he was just in the store." I'm like, "God damn it!" Tell him I said hi. And then uh, like a week later, he's like, a different story. Like, "Oh, Joe just came by, bought another bottle of your whiskey." I'm like, "Oh shit! Can you tell him I said hi?" And uh, we never got to hang out uh, in the distillery, but maybe there's some time. But anyways, I had I had this barrel, barrel number 16. I'm like, I'm going to let that one ride. Maybe Joe's going to pick it up. Who knows? And anyways, it uh, we barrel aged that one straight all the way through for 16 years. And wow. uh, we have uh, we're in a dry environment here. So we lose uh, about 4% evaporation per barrel a year. So... We got like, and we use 225 liters, so that's uh, what, 59 gallons. And uh, we had uh, about 12 cases out of that barrel. Wow, it's not too much, is it? No. I kept most of it for myself, but uh, we uh, we did release some of that. And then the whiskey release, uh, Pilsner whiskey from 99, release number four, was a uh, half barrel as well. Um, a great bourbon club, whiskey club bought it, uh, but they only bought half a barrel 
and then so I let it ride. It was in the it was in the barrel for twelve years, and then uh, I aged it for another year, year and a half, and then bottled that and released that, and that was super. And then going back to the whiskey three release, that was the six years in the barrel, eight years in the tank at full strength, one thirty two proof, and then the release two was uh, six years in the barrel, diluted to 110 proof, aged in the tank for six years, so, and then bottled uh, when it was 12 years old total, but six and six, and at 110 proof. That was the lot number two. And then lot number one was, uh, it was in the barrel for two years. I'm like, oh my God, it is so ready. Let's pick a barrel. Let's pick a barrel. I'm like, oh, that barrel looks good. Let's, let that barrel looks good. Let's try them, blend them together. Oh my God, that's it. And uh, we launched it and that was Pilsner 1. Now you, you so it seems like you, you waited longer and longer for each one of these. Uh, or was it just like the one-time distal run and then you, you It was the one-time just, run. Yeah. And then uh, I've since then started uh, distilling more uh, Czech style Pilsner. So um, we started up again in 2015. So it's three years in the barrel so far and it's coming along great. You know, I use some of it to, uh, I had to because it was so good. Uh, I make this, uh, this is the, the newest release of Doubled and Twisted. And uh, this is a blend of that uh, three-year Pilsner and three-year straight malt whiskey, this pure two-row malted barley whiskey, and uh, seven-year stout French oak-aged whiskey. So it's a blend of all three of those to make a 10-barrel blend. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. And it's 90 proof, too. It drinks like water. Uh, I've never released a whiskey so low before, uh, and uh, it kind of gets you in trouble a little bit. <laughs> that's all right it's you know you make it gets the best of us it gets the best of us sometimes yeah you know i drink it and uh it's like oh man what's going on here it's like stuff's kind of trying to mess with me it's pretty cool <laughs> it's 3 a.m <laughs> yeah so uh, you know one of the things that i, I also kind of want to talk about is because since this process is so different than just anybody that's doing four roses having a hill maker's bark and you're using a, uh, you, you talked about going through the TTB formula process. What was that like? Like, how did you get a, a category or anything that was sort of deemed okay in this? Because I've gone through and looked at what it takes to even just file a COLA. And I looked at even filing a formula. And for most of us that are listening to this podcast and drinkers, 90% of what we're going to be drinking is probably going to be straight bourbon whiskey, straight rye whiskey, stuff like that, where you don't need to file that sort of stuff. And the stuff that we don't really care about are the ones that have to file for new formulas because these are the ones that are straight rye whiskeys that are blended with Mountain Dew or something like that that's totally crazy that comes from, uh, you know, that's sold in Australia or something like that. So mm -hmm. kind of talk about the, the formula process. If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon. And that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon, the farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, 
transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's point of sale Go Mobile device for a battle tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award winning 24 7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at Shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase, and go to Shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. Kind of talk about the, the formula process. Working with the TTB is fabulous. Um, they are great. And uh, they're extremely busy these days <clears throat> with all the, <clears throat> excuse me, with all the different <clears throat> distilleries that are popping up. It's, uh, you know, it, it, you just got to get into it and do it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's getting, it's getting better. I mean, the, uh, there's automation now, you know, we don't have to just mail things into Cincinnati, Ohio anymore with the mail and wait for things to happen there. They're online and uh, there's formulas online and colas online and it's getting, uh, it's getting better and better and better and a little faster turnaround. Um, still not easy, but uh, you know, it's worth the time doing it. And, well, what, uh, What's your particular formula that they had to categorize this under is it still like a blended whiskey is it a straight blended whiskey like what what do they consider it uh they considered it flavored whiskey Mm -hmm. and with the flavored whiskey uh they say that you have to you have to declare the the dominant flavor and back in 99 they're like is there hops they're like oh hell yeah there's hops in there like okay well then you have to call this hop flavored whiskey i'm like well i don't want to call it hop flavored whiskey that's horrible name Mm-hmm. They're like, well, do you want to make it? I said, yeah, I want to make it. Like, well, then you got to call it hop flavored whiskey. Okay, top flavored whiskey. So that's like the official category of what it is. That is the class of spirit, hop mm-hmm. flavored whiskey. And is there anybody else that's doing this as well that you know of? Um, I think there's more and more uh, distilleries uh, distilling from uh, from delicious beer. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's bound to happen more. Um, you know, the, we're kind of grandfathered into the old school style of what hop flavored whiskey is because no one was doing it before us. Um, so it's getting a little bit more technical uh, with new formulas. But that's just the evolution of, of, a, of a spirit uh, class. And, uh, you know, we're in and... Uh, I'm sure other people are going to do it. They should. I mean, it makes total sense in my mind to do it. <laughs> I can see that too. So, you know, another the thing. Possibilities are wide open, you know? Mm-hmm. It's, it's just a thousand ex- styles of beer. Mm-hmm. So. so how many styles are you going to try to do? Well, I like contrast, you know? So um, I distill Czech style Pilsner Lager, um, a very complex, delicious stout, and a... Uh, big west coast ipa racer five mm-hmm. yeah, are you a cool. ipa person a pilsner stout where do you what's your go-to oh man <laughs> tough, tough call when you're, uh, when you're not drinking whiskey of course yeah um i just like good things you know there's delicious i mean there's so many delicious ipas out here the stouts are fantastic. Or there's one, uh, a local brewery about, uh, you know, 45 minutes away, North Coast. I mean, they're doing they're doing amazing stouts. I love Big Bear Black Style from Bear Republic. Um, I, I like Czech style Pilsner a lot, and it's really hard to find a really good, like, true European tasting Pilsner. Uh, Czech style Pilsner with the saws hops. Bottom fermenting yeast, truly lagered at 38 degrees for for weeks, and then bottled. It's just it's hard to beat for me. Mm-hmm. I'm with you. So I, I do have another kind of question, and it might be a little might be a little bit hairy, but I think you can work your way out of it. So there's there always are some people that are big snobs in the whiskey world, right? And they look at some of the things that you've been doing with Charvet, and they say that's not a true whiskey. Like, I'm not going to drink that's not a true whiskey. What's your what's your kind of response to that? Um, I wish I had more of what I made. Yeah, and I'm sad that I don't have much of this left. And if someone doesn't want to drink it, you know, there's no gun to their head. Mm-hmm. 
I'm fine with it. Yeah, there's Don't there's a lot it. of stuff. There's a lot of stuff on the market, so I'm sure they could they could find there's some other way. Plenty of other fantastic product over there that'll make them happy. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I'm busy, and uh, it's a real treat to be able to be busy and have seven people on staff and uh, doing and doing what we want to do and making product the way we want to make it. And uh, we're not having an issue with finding customers. Mm-hmm. No, nope, that's want, good though. They don't want to drink it. Don't drink it, man. Don't worry. No worries. <laughs> there you go. All those barrels. Everybody that's going to be able to watch this on video, he's got a bunch of barrels in the background. That's just just more for him and his friends, I guess. At the end of the day, I make more than I can drink now. It's awesome. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you can tell, but some of these are bigger barrels. I'm going bigger. Uh, a lot of people, it seems like, are going smaller because there's more oak extraction, faster extraction, not faster maturation because that's time, but faster extraction. And, you know, these barrels are 500 liters, so like 132 gallons. Oh, wow, so that's huge. Yeah, buddy. They're pungent barrels. And uh, the French oak, and they are just absolutely fantastic because I want to taste the whiskey that's in the barrel, not totally the barrel. So for my program, it's working out fantastically. And well, so let's... what's aging in those? Is that is that your, your next releases of, of Charbet whiskey uh, that'll be coming out? I've got some uh, 17 Pilsner. I've got some... Uh, 18 Mendo Blendo. That's a long, that's a, that's another story we can talk about. And, uh, I've got some straight malt whiskey in there as well. There you so go. So cool. I mean, some of these, uh, all, you know, some of these are going to be my son's, uh, college tuition barrels, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, well, that's some of them ride for 18, 25 years. Oh, wow. It's, yeah. Well, they're big barrels. So there, there should be enough liquid in there that they could, they could withstand 4% a year. I might, you know, consolidate after every five years or something like that and just keep them so that there's, you know, not at the end of the day, like five gallons hanging out in the bottom of it, you know, do some consolidation, but not every year. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's exciting. You're in for the long haul. That's for sure. So, Uh, yeah. So who are these people that don't want to drink the Charbet? (laughs) I'm not throwing names them on. Let's bring them (laughs) online, you know, um, or have them give me a call. Or maybe they just need to come over to Mendocino County and uh, to see what else is going on. Because, you know, just we'll put a blindfold on them and go, it's okay. You know, it's not traditional. It's not, you know, if you think it's not real whiskey, yeah, call it something else and just drink it. You'll like it. Yeah, because when you say it's not you traditional, know. there is this is something that before we started recording and kind of talking about was the one of the times that I had tried this. I was at my buddy's place and I tried it and I was like, yeah, it's pretty good. And he goes, but now breathe in. And you just do this like, and you do yeah. it. And it, I was like, is that, did they brew this with marijuana? <laughs> like, how did, how does this taste like pot? Yeah, hops and weed, hops and weed. They're all <laughs> kind of similar, you know, but uh, they've got that green herb spice in it. It's fabulous. It I'm was, happy. it was very unique to be able to do that. And it was something that we were even talking about beforehand of, uh, the day could possibly come that it's already coming to Canada that you could be mixing marijuana and and whiskey probably relatively soon. Yeah, you know if uh, you know if the U.S. Uh, clears it, then it's all good to go, and then it's all good to go, and it would all be good to go. But uh, you know, not uh, I'm not expecting that to happen anytime soon. So mm-hmm. it's got to keep them got to keep them separated. The yeah. Offspring, absolutely good yeah. song. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a there was another question that I kind of want to ask about too because I had, if I would have known that there were there was gonna be no more of these I'd be able to find on the shelves for quite a while I probably would have grabbed it but I remember oh, being in the store and seeing it but it has a pretty high price tag on it too right you're not like a fifty dollar bottle when it comes to these Char Bay releases uh, not the not the nineteen year old Pilsner. Um, no. I think that's more about 450 a bottle now. 
which is still less than a lot of people uh, releasing younger whiskeys out there, you know. Um, the uh, I, I travel around the U.S. doing some sales, and uh, I found uh, four of the Gold Top Whiskey Ones at this one store, and they were about, I don't know, two ninety five a bottle. And I said, oh, I'll give you $1,200 cash for all four of these. And the guy's like, oh, my God, really? Like, yeah, you know, you know, they've been here for 10 years, and you don't want them. I like, okay. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I got those. I stole them pretty much. And uh, went and talk, chatted up on some friends, and <clears throat> they found a home in seven minutes, you know. Mm-hmm. So. It was pretty cool. It was, it was fun doing that. Um, this uh, this product, the doubled and twisted. Mm-hmm. This is a ninety proof, and uh, it retails for fifty bucks. So there you go. So there is there is something that is middle of the yeah. road for everybody else. Yeah, it's kind of uh, my my business card. Uh, this bottle definitely overperforms for fifty dollars retail. It fits a little more uh, for my friends on, on the on-premise. Uh, it fits uh, cocktail programming for whiskeys a little better. Um, and uh, it's just fun to do. We have inventory now. And so we can do 10 barrel releases of this um, at a time now. Absolutely. There was this, there was this one account. And uh, they, they were super excited about our whiskeys. And they brought all, they got, they brought all three, four different uh releases out and I don't know something happened and they uh they messed up the uh the pricing on this and my friend was like I'm drinking Manhattans with your whiskey three I'm like damn high roller there you go I mean that's gotta be like a hundred and twenty dollar cocktail he's like uh thirteen dollars like oh really <laughs> so it was Friday I'm like come on guys and I took the crew to lunch at this place <laughs> where, where it was happening and we we're just sitting down having lunch and I said, Oh, can I get, um, can I get two Manhattans with the Charbet whiskey three? And they're like, sure. Why not? And, uh, they pour it and we have lunch and everything and, uh, we get the bill and everyone's like, how much were they? I'm like, Oh, like what? Like, oh, they weren't $13. <laughs> <laughs> they fixed it. They fixed really? the glitch. Yeah. 12 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Man, so, I was like, "Oh my God, you guys are losing some money." But the next day, I called our distributor. I called this. I I called the guys up at the at the restaurant. I'm like, "Hey, you know, something happened, but you know, uh, let's see what we can do uh, to uh, offset your losses right there." And uh, you know, uh, we got it, we got it situated and cleared up again. But uh, I mean, I would never do that with my whiskey three. Um, but uh, it was fun to do. Right. That's funny though. That's, <laughs> at least it was that I, I was expecting you to say, Oh, nope, they, they were actually a hundred and something dollars now. Yeah. I mean, I've never paid under eighty five dollars a shot for the whiskey three, you know. Um, so this was uh this was a blast. We're uh you know, we're making more of it and it's it's pretty cool. We've sold uh, actually we've already sold a couple barrels to the bourbon clubs um as a three year old and it is it is on its way to becoming the next Pilsner release. It's it's exciting. Are you about look, the, are you looking to sell those barrels like and they'll continue to age like just pre pre selling them? Is that is that the goal or are you are they buying no. it and bottling it three? Bottling it three. So it's almost like the uh, the whiskey one where it was uh, it was only in the barrel for two years. So this has exceeded that. It's three years, and uh, yeah, it's just it's it gives me flashbacks of when uh, that pilsner was was young in the barrel. It's pretty cool. Uh, I've got about 30, 40 barrels of it now, so we're gonna make another batch of that in uh, January when it gets nice and cold out. Is there a reason why you go for January instead of? I mean, I, I, it doesn't really matter. You're in California; it's it's seventy and sunny all the time, but. Yeah, uh, we're just slammed right now. You know, I do. Uh, we do other things as well, like custom bottling. Uh, we've got the other barrels to uh, to pull out for for barrel clubs that we're selling barrels to, and uh, the timing of it. I can't. Uh, I run my still myself. There's nobody else that runs my still. Uh, my dad will help, 
Um, but, uh, you know, I was trained and the way I run is, uh, I run 24 hours a day when I run the still and it takes me 10 days straight, 24 hours a day to, to knock out a run. So that's a, that's a chunk of time that, uh, I have to be pulled away from running our bottling line, um, or doing everything else, uh, running and running the show. So got to, got to pick a, got to pick like a half a, a half a, a month to uh, just block off and go up. Oh, you're not going to see me. I'm going to be right here for, you know, the next 10 days straight. Well, I'm glad you could make some time for us. Is there yeah, any, man. Yeah, any, any sort of growth plans with that to be able to kind of have consistent releases of this going out? Um, we'll see <laughs> to yeah. be determined. Yeah, you know, um, I'm distilling when I can. Uh, this year, I distilled a lot as far as, you know, as far as Charbet goes. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, pick up 27,000 gallons uh, from another microbrewery right here in town. Um, and uh, I was running for running for like forever, it feel, felt like, like two months. Because now running 10 days straight, 24 hours a day is tough. Um, you sleep like two hours at a time and stuff. And I've got a wife and, you know, two kids now and a business running. So it's, uh, I don't get to do just straight 10 day bomber runs. So my 10 day turns into 15, 16 days. So it's a, you know, it's a half a, half a month, you know, running this thing. And, uh, it's slow, but that's okay because it makes fantastic product, and that's what it's all about. I mean, I don't have a column still. Uh, I don't have a hybrid still. Um, I have a true million BTU live fire copper pot still. And uh, it's slow and inefficient, but like I said, you know, you focus on the body on the first run, and then you focus on the flavor on the second run. And uh, as a result, you're going to make something that's got a ton of body that can have a lot of flavor in it that can handle barrel aging and not be, you know, not fall apart, uh, you know, after time because, uh, you know, the oak influence took over and the flavor just drops off like a rock. That doesn't happen with our spirits because we distill it. We do a double distillation in a copper pot still. I mean, I love column stills. I think they're great. They get top note. They're efficient, you know, and uh, many different types of people can run them. Uh, but it's just uh, for making uh, whiskey and rum and brandy, I, I'm i happy with mine. Oh, awesome. So I got two more questions yeah. to kind of kind of wrap this up here. So talk about oh, the, yeah. na- the name Charbet. I don't think I actually asked, like, why, what, what's the name? What's it originate from? What's it, what's it mean? Charbet, uh, back in 1985, uh, in the winery, we, uh, we were, well, we had wines and we had brandies and, uh, no one was really drinking high end brandy, uh, made in California in the eighties. So we were trying to figure out, you know, what are, what are we going to do with this? <laughs> you know? And so we made wine, we had brandy. And so what do you do? You blend them together. So we took a dry Chardonnay wine that we made. And then we took our brandy and sweetened it into a liqueur and blended that brandy liqueur with a dry Chardonnay wine. And we made uh, a, a product, uh, a fortified wine, similar in style to a Pinot de Chiron. And uh, we did that in 85. And we're trying to come up with a name. And uh, we took C-H-A-R from Chardonnay and B-A-Y from brandy liqueur and fused the two products, fused the two words came up with Charbet and it's a lot easier to say than Karakashevich. Kashevich. So uh, <laughs> second so, that one. I'll second I'm that. Like, hey, why don't we just name the whole distillery and winery Charbet? And if someone brutalizes the word Charbet, I don't care. Yes. <laughs> my damn last name. <laughs> so it's real, stuck. real cool. Uh, and so last one, if anybody's out there trying to find a bottle or even hunt down something of, of one of the Charbet one through five releases, I mean, California, is that probably the only place? Can you find it in any other states? Where, where, where would you There's, be able to there find this? Might be, might be some in Texas, uh, New York, uh, Missouri, uh, California. Um, I don't think any of it made it over in Florida. But uh, I can't yeah, recall if I saw it one time in Tennessee as well. 
We did send some. We were sending some Charbet whiskey through to Tennessee, and man, every time every time that little order went out, I'm like, oh, that is awesome, man. We're sending California whiskey back to Tennessee, and that was just that. Uh, I really appreciated that. That was cool. Yeah, I do remember there was one store right now that now that it crosses my mind. I remember seeing it and saying, I don't know. I'll, I'll maybe some other time, but, but now that I know, I, I, was still, like, I was like, damn it, I should go back and get it. That my bottle might still be there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we'll see. I make a phone call to somebody, go check it out. Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Marco, uh, I want to so, say thank you again for coming on the show today. I do want to also give you the opportunity to plug if anybody wants to figure out if, if you've got a, a visitor center, people can see the distillery or follow you on social media, where would they do that? Well, um, we uh, we don't really have tours uh, set up at all here because you know, I can't sell retail direct or anything like that uh, to anybody. So um, it hasn't really made too much sense for us to do, unfortunately. But uh, we do Facebook. Uh, my wife, Jenny, uh, has that. I should have that. Uh, maybe I can text her real quick. Um, but, uh, yeah, we are we have Facebook and we have Instagram. Uh, and our website is charbay.com, C-H-A-R-B-A-Y.com. Oh, and, fantastic. you know, yeah, someone can go to our website and we could, uh, you know, we do our best to to uh, find a store that is near them or that could ship to them legally uh, inside or outside of the U.S. There you go. So if you're interested, yeah, go ahead and do that and get in touch with Jenny or Marco and I'm sure they're happy to try to figure out a way to sell you some whiskey and Instagram is at Charbay distillery. So that's how you oh, can find them. Thank you. Okay. Well, she's actually in the <laughs> chat. She's actually in the chat and she's telling me, and then Twitter is just at Charbay. So oh, <laughs> thanks Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> and Facebook is at Charbay distillery as well. So once again, Marco, thanks for joining and make sure totally. you follow Charbay on all those social media channels. Make sure you follow us as well. Bourbon Pursuit on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can see what, what we're drinking. Who knows? Might be a bottle of Charbay soon. We'll see what happens. Well, well, maybe we have to get you a sample bottle over there and put it right next to uh, Mr. Russell's stuff right there. Hey, wouldn't say no to that. That's for sure. Ah, thank you. <laughs> right on. Absolutely. And if you do like the show, you want to hear more interesting stories of distilleries that we've tried and, and found quite interesting, go ahead and support the show. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Bourbon Pursuit. And if you have any other show suggestions, hate mail, fan mail, anything like that, team at BourbonPursuit.com. With that, we will see everybody next week. Cheers. Cheers.